familiar question in studies of digital media. And that familiar question is, how do we think about digital medias inside, right? If what we encounter in the audience experience is something we can only kind of address by thinking there must be something going on inside, how do we talk about that inside? So um, while it's not actually the thesis of Sadie Plant's book, um, she does have a good um, cover for talking about it, um, I'd say there's one approach that seems to think if we could understand the way that computational storage is binary in the right way, or the way that computation itself is discrete in the right way, we would somehow get at what we need to get at. And I'd say there are others who've argued that what we really want access to is uncompiled source code, right? So SLSA has had a conference on code. Ars Electronica has had a conference on code. There's quite a bit of writing about code. Um, I would argue that that's not the approach that I want to take, and for a couple of reasons. One is, if you came into my office and I was working on a piece of software, and you said, what does your software do? And I said, here's the code. Why don't you read it over lunch? That would be extremely rude, right? Uh, because for a couple of reasons, right? One is, code is often not a good way of trying to get at what a piece of software does. In fact, handing code off from programmer to programmer is usually a big loss of sort of time and understanding and so on, even for well-commented code, right? Um, also, it's not the way people who write code tend to communicate to their audiences what their software does. They do things like write technical papers, write dissertations, give conference talks, and so on, that describe at a kind of high level what it is their software is doing. So in expressive processing, I don't talk very much about things like binary storage. And while I do sometimes quote from uncompiled source code, I'm quoting it in order to get at an idea that I call operational logics. And um, operational logics for me, are abstract processes that are used by authors to communicate to audiences that can be implemented in many ways. Right? So what do I mean by that? So for example, um, Knights of the Old Republic and many other games use what uh, an operational logic that I call collision detection, that's the most common name for it, to represent um, that two virtual objects can touch. So it can be implemented in many ways, what I mean, like this is a bounding box implementation of it in Microsoft's XNA, but the Atari 2600 that I talked about on the very first slide, that had collision detection, but it was implemented in hardware. The television interface adapter for the 2600 knew when it was drawing two objects that collided with each other, right? So it's not really important from this perspective, exactly how it's implemented, it's important what it's meant to communicate, right? That two virtual objects can touch. Um, Knights of the Old Republic uses widespread role-playing game logics for character and story that I call quest flags and dialogue trees. If you play um, a game from Bioware, they're implemented differently than if you play a game from Bethesda, but the same underlying structures are there. And um, while these logics are on some level exposed in the dialogue interface and the quest journal that we were looking at while playing the game, they are not identical to them. So for example, Mass Effect uses the same underlying dialogue tree logic, but it exposes it through a discourse act oriented interface rather than one that provides full sentences. But it's still an interface to the same logic. So more particularly, um, quest flags break a story down into quests and subquests with flags, variables, that are set at progress points. Um, the quest state is exposed to the player in a journal or something similar, right? So you noticed I was looking at my journal, was telling me I have to go talk with Shen now. Um, then game scripts that are activated at certain points update the flags in the journal, right? So you might have noticed that, you know, I had those little windows that came up and they would say things like you got experience points, but they would also say things like your quest journal was updated. That's one of these game scripts running. So this here is actually the journal editor for BioWare's Aurora tools. And if you're interested in sort of getting a feel for how this logic works, buy a copy of Neverwinter Nights. It's very cheap. It's less than $20. It comes with these Aurora tools for free. And these are still used inside BioWare for mocking up stories and also for doing interviews. If you apply for a job there as a writer, they ask you to make a quest in Aurora.
Um, then dialogue trees are, as you might expect, sort of hierarchically nested player character and non-player character options, right? So the, the non-player character says something, the player character has a set of possible responses, and so on. Um, this tree can do things like jump back up to um, earlier parts when you choose options, or end the conversation when you choose options. And also, different parts of the tree may be selected based on flags, right? So that's what we were seeing in the conversation with the guy in green, right? Is that when I went to his house, he chose the wrong section of his dialogue tree because the quest flags were not appropriately connecting to the dialogue tree. And um, this is a really important element of gameplay, right? So we saw me doing things like uh, able to initiate or defuse battles, able to accept or reject awards. These are also used for accepting and rejecting quests, making and breaking allegiances, and so on. It's not candy on top of the gameplay. It's not just like, and then you pretend to talk. Um, it's actually how you make a lot of the gameplay decisions and how you execute them. So this is the conversation editor from Aurora, in case you were wondering. Uh, I, I, I'm guessing that was pretty apparent, given the, the look of it. OK, so let's take a step back from those two interfaces. What are these logics that I'm talking about? So I'd say that quest flags are pretty much milestones, right? And dialogue trees are pretty much directed graphs. And any of us who know like say, any of us who've written a grant proposal, we know that milestones always perfectly mirror what happens in the real world, right? You write down a set of milestones and then those things happen. Well, I'll, I'll, okay, it's so obviously not, right? There are two things that happen with milestones. One is that as soon as you start doing the actual activity they are meant to represent, you throw them away and you have to make a new set of milestones. And the other is that you constantly try to deform the world to match the milestones you originally promised. And unfortunately, Knights of the Old Republic can't do either of these, right? It's always stuck with the originally encoded set of milestones. And that is part of why it runs into the kinds of trouble that it has. On the other hand, there are reasons you might want to use these systems, even if they cause you to run into trouble. Right? So one is that they're easy to implement and they're cheap at runtime. You aren't having a bunch of processor time taken away from the graphics in order to figure out what the story structure is. The story structure is fixed. Um, they're also really conceptually simple and accessible to non-programmer designers. The game industry has what I would regard as a problem, where it tends to hire into design positions people who are computationally illiterate and then pair them with engineers who don't understand the game design, right? So you need some sort of bridge between these two kinds of people, and something like this is simple enough that it can be on the design side of the fence. Um, now, I've been talking about one particular problem with this kind of structure, which is that it tends to be bug-prone when used ambitiously. And I'd say that bug-proneness comes from what I mentioned before, right? There's a vast number of possible positions in the simulated graphical world, a vast number of possible traversals I can make of the simulated graphical world, but there's a really tiny number of pre-encoded positions I can be in in the fictional world. And this mismatch, I'd say, is at the heart of the problem. And another way of putting it is that this is not the answer, right? This is not how people who have the ambitions of the designers of Knights of the Old Republic, which is not everyone's ambitions, but this is not how they're going to be able to reach their ambitions. And uh, obviously this isn't news, right? So a lot of people already know this. The community that I come out of, the writing community, has its own version of this insight. Right, so here's a, a sort of representation of a story as you like it by Raymond Quineau. And here's 100,000 billion poems. And one of these, this one, has um, been taken as sort of an inspiration by, I'd say, a, you know, a much more vibrant part of the writing community. And the difference between them is that this one gives a set of nodes and what all the possible transitions are between them. And this one gives a set of rules so that you can read the first line in any of these sonnets, the second line in any of these sonnets, the third line in any of these sonnets, and have it still operate syntactically, metrically, and so on, right? The short version of this might be to say, to create vast literary possibilities, don't hand author each option and connection. Use rules. And obviously, this is also understood in another tradition, 